Thank you, Stacy. Welcome everyone to today's Minnesota Demography and Aging Seminar sponsored by the Minnesota Population Center and the Life Course Center. Uh, today's speaker is Matt McGew, one of our University of Minnesota colleagues. Dr. McGew is a behavioral geneticist in the Department of Psychology and at the Center for Neurobehavioral Development. He has two primary lines of research. The first concerns the development of substance use disorders from adolescence to adulthood. And this work is based primarily on a series of long-term longitudinal studies he co-directs at the Minnesota Center for Twin and Family Research. Uh, the second line of work concerns genetic contributions to normative aging processes and mortality. And this is based primarily in Denmark, where he holds a guest professor position in the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Southern Denmark. Uh, Dr. McGew has an impressive publication record with nearly 1,000 publications and dozens of research grants. He has numerous awards to his credit, including a Regents professors Professorship at the University and awards for lifetime contributions to twin research and behavioral genetic research. His talk today is Non-Cognitive Skills and Social Success, Evidence from the Minnesota Center for Twin and Family Research Longitudinal Studies. So as is customary, Dr. McGew, you'll receive a seminar series in the mug, or se seminar series mug in the mail, of course, that you can only get by giving a talk in this series. So without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. McGew. Oh, I didn't know I was going to get the mug. That's very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, this invitation to participate in your seminar. I wish that um, I wish that I could a 10 year seminar regularly, although as it turns out, I have a seminar I've run for 30 years that meets at Monday at noon. And since it's been running for 30 years at Monday at noon, it's kind of hard. I'm sure you appreciate it. It's hard to, hard to change. Although I'm skipping, obviously skipping it today. And I appreciate the introduction, Sarah. I, I hope to God, I, I don't have a thousand publications. I'm sure I don't, but maybe I have too many, but not quite that many. So thank you very much. So, um, See if I can get this. So this is an overview, time permitting, of uh, what I hope to go uh, talk with you about this uh, afternoon. Uh, I understand that that I should go 45 minutes and leave time for questions. So I'll try to monitor the the, the time closely. I may end up cutting things out, so I, I fit everything in. I don't really, it doesn't matter to me if you want to ask me a question, especially if a clarifying question as I'm going through. Although I could also talk about, uh, try to answer your questions at the end, but certainly feel free, I guess in the chat box to ask a question if you have any questions as I'm going through, especially if I'm unclear, I'd appreciate that. I really don't know how formal or informal the seminar normally is. I'm sure it's all atypical this year though. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is the research context. The Minnesota Center for Twin and Family Research, this is a research that I've been involved in here for about 30 years. And the Minnesota Center for Twin and Family Research was begun a little over 30 years ago. There's a picture of a, a lot of the different uh, uh, staff members. I'm not there, I wasn't there the day they did that Zoom call, uh, that, that uh, work at the Minnesota Center. There's about maybe 40 people that work there. Uh, we've been funded uh, since 1987 by various NIH institutes. And what we're engaged in is longitudinal psychological research with a major focus on the origins and consequences of substance abuse, in particular, adolescent substance abuse. Um, so we're funded by the National Institute of Drug Abuse, the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. The, I'm not gonna talk about substance abuse. That's been our major focus, but as you'll see, I'm not gonna talk about that here today. I'm gonna talk about something that I think probably many in the audience are more expert at it than I am. And, and then I'm hope, hopeful to get your insights, but I'll come to that in a second. Um, I'm gonna talk about two of the longitudinal studies that we've been involved in. Uh, they're pretty longstanding studies. And the basic sampling unit at our center is a family, a four person family, two offspring and two parents. Almost always, and you'll see the reason for this is we, we do have some same-sex parent pairs, but they're, they're pretty uncommon in our sample. And I think that's really a reflection of the way the sample was drawn. They were drawn from, as you'll see, I'll, I'll comment on this in a couple of minutes. They're drawn from birth records and official records where a mother and a father is designated. So it, it 
the, the basic sampling unit, which is unique in psychology, is to have a family, both, both parents and two offspring. And the, the different studies that we've undertaken are distinguished by the relationship of the offspring. Sometimes the offspring are twins, monozygotic or dizygotic, and sometimes they're siblings, either full biological siblings or adopted siblings. Adopted siblings are individuals who grew up together but are not genetically related to one another. So I'm gonna, in, in the talk today, I'm gonna use data from two of these longitudinal studies. The, the first is what we call the Minnesota Twin Family Study. It's a study of almost 1,400 pair of like sex twins, male, male, female, female, um, that we ascertained for Minnesota state birth records. As I'm sure many of you appreciate, the birth records in Minnesota are a matter of public record. That doesn't mean they're easy to gain access to, but you can gain access to, and, and we have gained access to them over the years. And so we started back in roughly 1990, we started a study when the twins are either age 11, a different cohort at age 17, and we've been following them ever since. And um, we're actually, they're middle age now, and these assessments are ongoing. Up to this point, we have actually maintained pretty high participation rate uh, across the multiple ways of assessments. And the assessments are pretty, uh, pretty involved. They, they usually take at least six hours, sometimes a full day uh, of, of the twins time. So a couple things and maybe some limitations about the Minnesota Twin Family Study. These are the birth years sampled. And again, these are based on Minnesota birth records. So uh, we identified twins from birth records in these years. For those years, overwhelmingly births in Minnesota were of European background. So the sample is, the twin sample is pretty, uh, pretty limited in terms of ethnic diversity. Um, we have all the partic all the mothers in the families participated and a very high percentage of the fathers. Again, I, I don't know about your research, but uh, it, in, in the type of research we do, it's fairly atypical to be able to, to, to actually assess the parents. And we did. The second study is a much different type of study, although the, the assessment protocol is very similar. And we call it, I won't get in, into trying to explain why the, the, the acronym, the Sibling Interaction and Behavior Study, SIBS, but it's a study of 409 adoptive and 208 non-adoptive families. Just like the twins, they were identified through, systematically through official records. In the case of the non-adoptive families, we could go back to the birth records and find families with uh, with full biological siblings. Those are easy to identify. The adoptive families, we worked with three large adoption agencies in Minnesota uh, to identify families with adopted siblings. Again, there's two kids in every family. And then uh, here it was a little bit different. It, it, we couldn't really time the assessments to the age. So we have, we're actually in the fourth assessment now. Uh, we started, again, fairly good participation rates we're you know, maybe 80%, 90% done with this, uh, and they're uh, in early adulthood at the last, last follow-up. So those are the two uh, longitudinal, oh, in terms of just uh, some characteristics, they're a little bit younger than the twins, the, 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 the Sibs families. They are also going to be representative of adoptions in Minnesota, non-familial adoptions. So there's much greater ethnic variability, and in fact, quite a few, of the adopted individuals in our sample are of East Asian, actually Korean ancestry. Again, we get a fairly high percentage of both the, the, the rearing mothers and the rearing fathers. We don't know anything about the birth families of the adopted individuals. So those are the two longitudinal studies I'm gonna talk about. The phenotype I'd like to talk about, again, we, we're substance abuse researchers, but I've more recently got interested in educational attainment and particularly college attainment. Uh, and now all the, the participants in our study, the offspring, are really past the age at which you would expect them to have completed their degrees. Maybe some will still complete it, but not very many. And the reason I'm interested in college attainment is for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's important and it's widely recognized, even politically, it's maybe arguably, maybe one of the few political areas where there's bipartisan agreement, a strong su political support for um, 
for educational, uh, supporting the educational attainment of, of uh, young people. Um, maybe this is illustrated no better than, than by Barack Obama. This is a quote, uh, I guess, prior to his being elected from, from, for president. Uh, he was a great advocate, it still is a great advocate for, for college, supporting uh, individuals' uh, ability to get a college education, in part because, as reflected in the quote, uh, Obama saw it as playing a fundamental role in his ability as well as Michelle's ability uh, to have achieved uh, what they achieved in their life, the many things that they achieved. And really Obama's beliefs about the importance of education are, are validated by sociological research. This is a quote uh, from a, a relatively recent annual review of sociology uh, article by the sociologist, uh, Michael Hope. Um, education makes life better. Uh, there are a lot of positive features that are associated with a college education. So the first reason I'm interested in college education is it's because it's something that in general, most of the population values. The second reason I'm interested in it is Sarah mentioned that I'm a behavioral geneticist. And as behavioral genetic traits go, educational attainment is really kind of atypical. Um, at the end of the, the last century, a, a very prominent behavioral geneticist, Eric Turkheimer at the University of uh, Virginia summarized a lot of behavioral genetic research up to that point in terms of what he called three laws. And the three laws were that individual differences in virtually all behavioral traits appear to have some genetic component associated with them. That's his first law. But genetics was not everything. Our behavior is certainly not genetically determined. The environment is also important. But what he concluded in the second and third law is that the important environmental factors that appeared to contribute to individual differences in behavior appeared to be what behavioral geneticists call the non-shared environment rather than the shared family environment. Another way of thinking about it is what he was arguing and, and many behavioral geneticists believe is that growing up in the same home doesn't seem to have much impact on the psychological similarity of the people growing up in, the, in that home. Nonetheless, the environment is important, but it seems to be the environment that's unique to each individual growing up in the home, not what they share by virtue of their common rearing. Educational attainment, this is a paper we published last year. Educational attainment is an exception to uh, Turkheimer's laws in that, yes, it's not an exception to the first law. This is just based on a large sample of twins and this portions uh, individual differences, phenotypic variability in terms of genetic, shared environmental, and unique environmental components of variants. The genetics is it, for different birth cohorts and for men and women separately. But just the overview here, genetics is important, which is his first law. But unlike most behavioral traits, growing up in the same home is extremely important in understanding educational attainment. So it's a, an exceptional trait from a behavioral uh, genetic perspective. If, if I study personality and I have, growing up in the same home does not seem to have much impact on how similar you are in terms of your personality. But in terms of your level of educational attainment, it does seem to have a big impact. And that's the one thing I will, I'll talk about a little bit here this afternoon. Um, uh, this is something that a sociologist has picked up on. Uh, the sociologist who, who's now at Stanford, Jeremy Fries. Um, why is it that educational attainment, unlike most behavioral and social traits, shows this strong shared environmental effect? So looking at those two cohorts, what I'm gonna do is look at factors in, that we've assessed in adolescence, uh, both in the twins and in the, the SIB study, the adopted, uh, non-adopted siblings as well as their outcomes as young adults. The first uh, study I wanna talk about is admittedly a study that I'm just about done with the paper and I'll post it on one of the archives as soon as I'm done with it, but it has not undergone peer review. So take it with a little grain of salt, but um, it, it's very close to being finalized, but it's not a published paper. 
Um, but it really reflects one of the things I'm very interested in here. If you ask psychometrically oriented psychologists about what psychological factors are important to educational attainment, almost inevitably they will focus on what I'll call general cognitive ability, um, sometimes called intelligence, often measured, but not always, by uh, what's called an IQ test. And this is a quote from a, a book that was just published last year by a prominent psycho, psychometrician, Russell Warren, that kind of reflects this belief that if you want to understand uh, educational attainment, that the, the, the primary factor you should look at is intelligence or IQ. And in fact, from his, his perspective, um, that having a high IQ is a necessary maybe not a sufficient, but a necessary condition for educational, at least collegiate success. And if I look at our data, our data do provide some empirical support for the worn and psychometric position. This is just a plot of the average IQ. And IQ is just a way of scaling general cognitive ability to a, an overall population mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So this is a plot of mean IQs as a function of educational attainment in the roughly 2,600 offspring I have in the twin studies. And you can see that uh, there's an increase in average IQ uh, with higher levels of educational attainment. So there's an association there. But what this, what, what's this uh, plot of the mean IQ as a function of educational attainment obscures is that there's a phenomenal amount of variability underlying those means. And so here I've plotted the density plots, I guess it's a little bit less than 2,600 individuals uh, based on their highest degree. I, I collapsed some college with just a high, high school uh, uh, degree. And what you can see is that there's extreme amount, even though the means do progress with higher levels of educational attainment, there's actually an extreme amount of variability in underlying general cognitive ability. It's that variability that I'm particularly interested in in this first study. I've split up our sample as to whether or not, now they're, they're adults, so I know for the most part if they've completed a college degree, they're 29. So the, again, some might complete a college degree later in life, but not very many, or not completed a college degree. And I've assessed, we've assessed their general cognitive or IQ when they were adolescents, so approximately 12 years earlier. And I divided them up somewhat arbitrarily, but not entirely into to a low, medium, and high group. The high group are individuals who have an IQ of 110 or, or more. And the reason I use 110 is that that's the average IQ in the sample for people who have a professional or graduate degree. The low IQ or GCA group were individuals who had an IQ of 90 or less. 90 I picked because that's the average IQ in our sample of individuals who did not complete high school. And you can see that there are individuals in all groups, but what I'm particularly interested in are the groups that maybe from the standard psychometric model, they might be hard to understand. The first group maybe is not that hard to understand. Individuals with a high IQ, they do not get a, a college degree. People like um, uh, Bill Gates or Stephen Jobs would fit into here, right? So we, we could imagine a lot of scenarios for that. The interesting group I would argue is this group here that people like Warren would say should not have been able to complete college. They have a, 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 a tested IQ less than 90, and, but we have about 200 individuals in our sample who despite the test score were able to complete their college degree. One of the things, I, I, I won't talk too much about it, but one of the things to note here is that this group is predominantly women, whereas this group is predominantly men, um, which is, is an important thing, although I won't talk too much about gender here. What I'm interested in are two things I'm, about this. These, I'm, gonna cut uh, in. What, what, I'm sorry, it's a question. That's all right. It looks like maybe we have a question, quick. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Matt, uh, how are you interpreting this IQ? It's IQ during adolescence? Are you interpreting that as something reflecting investments in children up to that point or only genetics? Or what does IQ mean in this? So, I, 
I'm not a, hi Jerry, how you doing? It's nice Very to see good. you. How are you, Matt? Um, so what it is 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 their it's their general cognitive ability estimated when they were age 17. So we reflect all, I guess, the parental investments, and I'll hopefully get to that a little bit later. Is there evidence of, of parental investments paying off in terms of you know child cognitive function? There are, and we'll hopefully get to that. Um, as well as genetic endowment and, and everything else. Okay. I'm interested in two things about this, these, what I'll call, for better, lack of a better term, non-standard GCI profile groups. One is, do they experience the benefits of getting a college degree to the same degree as individuals who have a high level of uh, GCA? And secondly, what are the factors that account for their educational success? So, but before I try to answer these two questions, one of the things I should do is confirm that in fact, the, the groups really are extreme on general cognitive ability. Um, it could be that when we assess them in adolescence, it was a bad day, but it turns out that two thirds of the sample, I've reset, we've reassessed their general cognitive ability about seven years later. And without going into great detail here, and, in, and the most important group here is, is this group here, the low GCA group that, that, that uh, completed a college degree, you can see that maybe this is, is a little bit too low, but they still have a, an average IQ that's, that's quite a bit lower than the high GCA group that completed college. So originally it might've been 35 IQ points and on retest 28 IQ points, but I'm not selecting, the point here is I'm not selecting them based on a bad day of, of assessing uh, their ability. There, it, it actually seems that they have, they, they perform poorly on this particular general cognitive ability assessment. What are the benefits of a college education? We're all involved at, at a university and I think we discuss this a lot, uh, certainly in CLA. Um, college education is thought to develop your, your critical thinking skills, to help you develop a, a philosophy of life uh, so that you can lead a, a purposeful life. Those things are hard to measure. On a more practical level, what, if, if I look at what uh, sociologists, at least my reading in the literature, and uh, economists have looked at um, in terms of, of what a college education might uh, allow you to achieve. It's more practical things like a job and making money and, and being healthy uh, and, and being a, a good member of your uh, community, a good citizen. So in terms of looking at outcomes that might be associated with college at age 29, I'm looking at four. Um, their occupational attainment, which I'm sure you guys could, some of you could criticize. We, we, I'm coding it on a Hollingshead scale where I flipped the scale. So one is low to seven high. So uh, their income at age 29, if they're working, whether or not they're economically independent of both their parents and the government, and whether or not they experience uh, minor legal problems like problems with drugs or uh, ending up in court. The first thing is that um, psychology, the first thing is that college attainment is associated with all four of these outcomes, which is what you'd expect from the HOUT review. Um, psychologists tend to report things as standardized mean differences. So these are the, the overall standardized mean difference between college educated individuals and non college educated individuals on these four outcomes. So there's one standard deviation deviation difference in their occupational attainment. That corresponds to about one and a half points on the Hollingshead scale. About a half a standard deviation in log income, similarly in the, on the scale of, of economic independence, a little bit less of an effect, but in the right direction. So typically when I report things, and these will always be confidence intervals, which tend to be narrow because the samples are fairly large. The important thing here, for me anyway, is this is the overall effect of college. Does the benefits associated with college differ depending upon whether or not you're in the high versus low general cognitive ability group? And the answer to that is just generally no in our sample. These are 
uh, for the, the three groups, low, medium, and high general cognitive ability, I'm comparing their occupation to the occupation, the mean occupation of everybody that did not get a college degree. And what you can see is that there's very little difference across the three groups. They all appear to benefit from college to an equal degree. In, in, in fact, for occupation, the high GCA group benefits a little bit more, but it's not a big effect. In every case, the benefits do not appear to depend in any way on whether or not they're in the low GCA group versus the high GCA group. So the answer to the first question seems to be that they benefit just as much from college as any other group that went through college. The second thing I, I want to talk about uh, or question is, well, why? Why do they, they, are they able, despite what psychometricians might expect, why are they able to achieve in college? Um, the, there's two factors that I'll look at, maybe not surprisingly. One I'll call non-ability personality traits. They're variously called non-cognitive skills, soft skills, non-ability personality factors. Um, and rearing family social economic status is the two. And as you'll see, both of them seem to contribute to the success of this, eight, what I'm calling an atypical group. Uh, I think I'll just skip this and, and, uh, because in the interest of time and just cut to the, the personality factors that uh, we're looking at in, in the study. Um, there are five that we look at the, the, the five uh, we measure again in adolescence. So this is prior to whatever level of educational achievement they've attained, will have attained. Uh, they, and they relate to things like uh, willingness to postpone reward, impulse control, uh, a commitment to working hard and a, a belief that working hard actually pays off. And I've looked at five of these from the many personality factors uh, that we measure in our study. And I, I actually just form a composite of all five. In terms of the rearing social economic status, I look at the educational level of the parents, the occupational level of the parents, again, measured on this Hollings at uh, scale, uh, the gross income of the parents, and then I also form a composite of those three. So here are the, non-standard groups, and in this case, I'm, I'm plotting the means. So if I look at the, uh, the low GCA group, those who did not complete a college degree versus those who did complete a college degree, those who complete a college degree score about seven tenths of a standard deviation higher on the personality composite and about seven tenths of a standard deviation in their rearing social class. Similarly, the the, not all the high GCA people who didn't go to college are like Bill Gates uh, because, uh, or, or Stephen Jobs. Um, they score about seven, ten or stand, uh, seven tenths of a standard deviation lower on uh, the personality composite and similarly about seven ten, tenths of a standard deviation lower on the SES composite. These are associations. Can we claim though that they are actually causal? One of Heckman, who the, the economist that Jerry will know well, Heckman's complaint about psychology, which I think is le legitimate, is that uh, we're quick to, to report predictions or associations, but we're not so good about drawing causal inferences from those. Um, economists are very good at, at, at identifying instruments uh, in their studies, exogenous, uh, variables that are independent of, uh, of exposure um, or a proxy of exposure. It, for, for things like um, personality factors and even rearing SES, I think it's a little bit more challenging for a psychologist to come up with appropriate instruments. Alternatively, we could try to measure what we think are all the potential confounding factors, let's say between personality and attaining a college degree and we kind of could try to adjust those in some sort of regression model. But that has, as I'm sure you recognize, its own limitations. We might not measure all the factors or we might not measure them well. One of the things that we become interested in as well as other people 
in the field of behavioral genetics or genetics more broadly is the use of genetic designs or within family designs. Uh, and actually Jerry has done some of this work um, with, with education uh, to look at uh, within family comparisons because within family comparisons can actually control for many of the potential confounders without ever actually having measured those confounders. So for example, looking at discordant MZ twins, this is a, a, a pair of relatively famous German uh, monozygotic twins. Uh, this is Otto, that's Evolt. Um, Evolt was a, a weightlifter, right? Um, they have the same genotype, they grew up in the same home, but he was a, a physical fitness fanatic and his brother was not. Um, and so if whatever the benefits of physical fitness, you would expect Evolt to experience those to a greater degree than his twin brother, Otto. Um, and by comparing the two, right, we're, we're, we're controlling for a lot of potential relevant factors, genetic background, as well as their varying circumstances. We can do this with the personality factor. We can't do it with SES because the twins perfectly share the rearing SES, but we can look at whether or not differences in personality predict differences in college attainment in MZ twins. And in fact, in our sample, they do. If I look at, we have 100 pair, roughly 100 pairs, 99 pair of monozygotic twins where one completed a college degree and one did not. And they break, in terms of their GCA group, they break out into these three groups. In every group, the, more, the, the twin who completed college on average scored higher on the personality composite than the twin who did not. So that personality difference between uh, the, the, the twins can't be due to their genotype or their varying family circumstances. It doesn't prove causation, but it certainly strengthens the, the notion of causation. And this is not only true of the overall composite, this just illustrates that it's true, at least for four of the components going into the composite. There's another way that we've looked at within family comparisons uh, with our, our data, and that really takes advantage of, of the parents, which I think is a unique feature of our longitudinal studies. Um, we can look at uh, within family social mobility, whether or not children move up or down relative to their parents. And we've looked at this both in terms of educational attainment here and occupational attainment. Uh, the results are very similar. Uh, what's plotted here is on a five point education, uh, educational attainment scale, going from not completing high school on up to completing a graduate degree, the difference between the educational attainment of the parents versus their children. Um, and in terms of education uh, for, this, uh, for, this, for these cohorts, these birth cohorts, there's still an expansion of education across generations so I think it's roughly 40% of the men and almost 50% of the women attain a greater educational level than their parents did. So there's still upward mobility. I think that's flattened out more recently. Um, this is just the same thing for occupational status. And by uh, the parents, you mean the highest education of the parents? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good, Jerry. It's, it's the, the maximum education, education of the two parents. parents. It's the maximum occupation. That's right. So you move up if you if you get more in, in this scheme if you have greater greater education level than the best educated of your parents. So, okay. Sorry, sorry, I got a late print. <laughs> okay, stand up for a second. I apologize. So just just like within uh, MZ twins is discordant for college, if we look at parent offspring differences in their personalities. I measure the same personality factors and it computes the same composite in the parents as in the offspring. When children move up relative to their parents educationally, and actually it's true occupationally as well. These are the kids that are moving up. These are the kids that are moving down. The ones that move up have a higher education on average, a higher educational composite score than the ones moving down. So, so in two, two ways, ways uh, we, we find, find that, that within families, families yes, yes and, and, and and educational attainment is associated with these non-ability personality, personality factors. 
I'm sorry, Matt. I'm going to mute you quick. Something's going on with your microphone, so I'm going to just mute you and ask you to unmute, see if that fixes it. Did that get better? Did it get better or no? It's still a little weird echoey. Can you maybe try disconnecting your audio and connecting it again? I should do that. So uh, near your mute button, there should be a selection to select, change your microphone. A little arrow that says select microphone. Maybe just retry that here. Um, near, near, near the mute button. There, okay. Select, select the microphone, yes. Okay, does that help? Yes, that's yes. better, thank you. Okay, I apologize, I'm at home. I couldn't make it into the office today. I, was, I, I apologize, I watch my time. Um, so personality is a predictor of educational attainment, not only overall, but within families, both within MZ twins who are discordant for college, as well as intergenerational mobility. That doesn't prove it's causal, but it certainly strengthens the argument that it's a causal influence. Well, what about rearing SES, the last uh, major results I want to give you? And this is actually work that's done by two graduates here at the University of Minnesota, Emily Willoughby and Elise Anderson, they've been working uh, with over the last couple of years. Um, not surprisingly, college attainment is associated with um, it is transmitted across generations. This is, I'm now going to use data from the uh, SIBS cohort. Uh, so this is uh, just the number of parents who have a college degree in the family and the likelihood that um, the offspring have attained college. And you can see actually the, the rates of college attainment are, are quite dramatic. If you have two college educated parents, about 80% of the offspring attain college. So there's a, a, a rather strong association. But that association may reflect genetic factors as well as the rearing environment, right? Because these are, th this is the non-adopted families. So it may be due to genetic confounding. However, we have the adopted families as well. And there's no basis for genetic similarity. There's no evidence of selective placement in the adoptive families. So this is the association between having college educated parents and college ed attainment in the offspring in the non-adopted genetically related families. This is the same uh, plot for the adopted non-genetically related. The effect is not as strong. The odds ratio is 1.5 versus 2.6, which is reflective of genetic factors, but there's still an environmental effect here. So there is something environmental. What is it that the adopted families do to support the educational achievement of the non-genetically related children that they're rearing. Well, one thing we could ask is, do they uh, advance the, the educational uh, likelihood of their children by skill building, by uh, helping them de develop uh, both cognitively and in terms of these personality factors? This is the association between the number of parents that have a college degree and general cognitive ability and the personality composite, again, on this standardized score in the non-adoptive family. So this reflects potentially both genetic and the family environmental effect. And there's a rather strong association that the general cognitive ability as well as the personality factors are higher if in families with two college educated parents than with no college educated parents. The key group is the adoptive families. The effects aren't as great. In fact, there's no effect at all for personality, but there is a significant effect. Children growing up with two, even though they're not genetically related, children growing up with two uh, parents with a college education score higher on general cognitive ability factors than parents who grow up with two adopted parents who don't have a college education. So there is, there, there is some evidence for skill building, at least in the cognitive ability domain. We don't really find any here. Okay, almost. 
There's another way uh, to try to confirm this, which is actually kind of interesting. It's called the genetic nurture effect. Um, so I, I'd like some other way of, of, of confirming what we observe. The adoption families are somewhat unique, as I'm sure you appreciate. So there would be, it'd be nice if there were another way of looking at this. And there is another way. Um, if, if something is just genetically transmitted in, uh, in families from parents to offspring, well, it's not so much the parent genotype that affects the offspring genotype because there's meiotic segregation, right? So the parents don't transmit their whole genotype to the offspring. They transmit half of their genotype, right? So there are transmitted alleles and non-transmitted alleles. And it's really, if there's a genetic effect, it's the transmitted alleles that are affecting the offspring's phenotype, right? So that's if there's genetic transmission. However, if the parent phenotype is influencing the offspring phenotype, then it opens up a pathway by which the non-transmitted alleles, which there is no genetic reason for these non-transmitted alleles to be associated with the phenotype. But if the parent phenotype is environmentally affecting the offspring phenotype, then there is a pathway. That's called a genetic nurture pathway. And it provides an alternative way of trying to confirm an environmental mechanism of transmission within families, although in this case, not adoptive families. We don't need to look at the adoption. It depends on being able to measure the underlying genotypes, but that actually in the GWAS era, which I assume that people know about, GWAS has really provided a, a way of, of providing estimates of underlying genetic scores. This is the most recent uh, GWAS of educational attainment by the Social Science Genetics Association a Consortium, a large consortium. I don't know how many different institutions. Uh, the last time they did this, which a couple of years ago, they had a sample size of over a million individuals. This is the underlying Manhattan plot. They had over a thousand significant effects. And one could take the results from these and compute what are called polygenic scores, which is weighting the individual. There are uh, millions of, of individual genetic variants or single nucleotide polymorphisms here in the plot, SNPs. We can weight these to give, give an, uh, uh, an overall uh, genetic score. Um, and these overall genetic scores probably correlate about, uh, they're not perfect by any means, uh, they correlate about maybe point, uh, an R squared about 10% with educational attainment. Uh, so they're accounting for about 10% of the educational attainment um, uh, phenotype. But it provides a way of, of estimating that parent ge genetic effect. And without getting into the technicalities, we can actually then, because we've actually uh, genotyped our participants on a GWAS array. And so we can compute these uh, polygenic scores using the results from a GWAS like this. And when we do that, this is a paper that um, came out a little while ago. It's a little complicated. Um, this is the percentage of variance accounted for by the offspring's polygenic score. So as I said, the polygenic score accounts for about 10%, in this case, 9% of years of education. It's also significantly correlated with general cognitive ability. Soft skills are the personality factor as well, although to a much lesser degree. This is the, the genetic nurture effect. Does the parent genotype predict over and beyond uh, the offspring genotype, which is the same as the effect of the non-transmitted allele? And the point here, the effects aren't big, but the point here is that yes, we get a genetic nurture effect for years of education, completely consistent with the adoption results, that there's environmental transmission of, of educational attainment within the adoptive families. And that genetic nurture effect is associated with skill building, both, again, the effects aren't large, we wouldn't really necessarily expect them to be large, both in general cognibility and in this case, in the personality domain as well. Although the p-values may be a little bit marginal, but, it, but it, they're both significant conclusions, and then I'll allow you to ask whatever questions you have. Okay, what can we conclude? While GCA, general cognibility, 
almost certainly contributes to the likelihood of educational success. It appears to be neither sufficient. That's not surprising at all. We all know about the Steve Jobs and the Bill Gates in the world, nor necessary. That is more unexpected from the psychometric model. Individuals can attain educationally despite what the psychometricians might consider a, not a, 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 a level of, of cognitive ability not compatible with educational. What's more and perhaps more important is at least the way we tried to assess the benefits of completing a college degree, we didn't find any effect other than a small effect on occupational status of general cognitive ability on these outcomes once we controlled for attainment of college. Or another way of saying it is that um, this unexpected group that uh, completed a college degree appeared to accrue every benefit that the high ability group did when they completed their college degree. Two factors appear to in part contribute uh, to the educational success of the non-standard uh, group, uh, non-ability personality factors, Within family designs are compatible, although certainly don't prove uh, that those personality factors are probably uh, causal. And rearing social economic status. Again, two independent lines of evidence suggesting that these are also causally contributed, the adoption of results and the genetic nurture design. Where do we go from here? Heckman was right that psychologists are, are, are I think, pretty bad at uh, trying to address causality in observational studies, I personally think genetics holds significant potential for psychologists to, uh, to try to leverage genetic designs to uh, more rigorously test causal hypotheses. Designs like the, uh, the, the MC twin difference design, the genetic nurture design, or what many of you may, may know about as uh, Mendelian randomization designs. Secondly, we know relatively little about the non-ability. We know a lot about the ability factors related to social achievements. I, I would argue we know much less about what the relevant personality factors are. When our, our group is trying to gain a better understanding of that. And then finally, uh, I've argued that skill building is, is one way that, that parents um, can advance the educational uh, achievement of their children but it clearly doesn't account for all of it. And so a question that, that we're trying to address in, in what is admittedly a relatively new area for us is what are the other things that, that parents are doing environmentally? Uh, those are papers, I guess, we, I cited it along the way from our group. And then uh, I've already uh, thanked Emily and Elise who are graduate students in the Department of Psychology here Aldo, maybe some of you know Aldo. Aldo is the member of our Department of Economics. Bill Iacono and James Lee are colleagues in the Department of Psychology. And Wendy is a, a colleague at the University of Edinburgh. So I thank them for their help and I thank you for your attention. And I guess, oh, not too long, it's four minutes. Left. All right, we're opening up for questions here. So go ahead and use the raise hand function if you'd like to ask your question aloud. Otherwise, it looks like we may have a couple short questions in the chat box. Do I look at the chat box? I can read them out to you. Oh yeah, I can look at it, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, I've got to move the box though. So. Okay, I'll, I'll work, welcome, oops. <laughs> that's, that's the welcome, I shouldn't read that one. Matt, in your study, how do you identify genetics from shared by using, yes, in, so the first question in the, is a twin study. And so twins, the, the, the correlations of twins are used, uh, kind of a standard uh, thing that twin researchers do to estimate the proportion of variants associated with genetics, the proportion of variants associated with growing up in the same home environmentally, and the proportion of variants that, uh, is associated with the unique environment. So yes, that's that will, is what we did. How did you form the composite? Is from Abby. Hi, Abby. Uh, so I formed the composite. One of the things, Abby, is that uh, I'm not sure that it, it, 
I picked the the personality factors a priori because I didn't want to look at the data. I'm not sure that I've picked all the right factors. I really don't know about that. But what I did do is um, I standardized them, and then I just formed the the composite by taking the standard the sum of the standard scores. Ah, so this okay, Jane Lee. To what extent was transracial adoption considered in the case of adopted? They're not, a, a, this is a great question. They're not adopted twins. I apologize if I was confusing that. They're adopted individuals. We actually have no adopted twins. So they're adopted individuals, but they're siblings, right? So, so there are two adopted individuals in a home. So they're siblings, but they're not genetically related to one another. In fact, we even confirmed that because we ended up genotyping them. But this is an important question, something that, that people in our group are interested in. Um, the uh, most of the non-European adopted individuals in our sample, not all of them, but I would say well over 95% uh, are transracially or transethnically adopted. That is, uh, they're growing up in, in homes with parents with European, uh, who are of European ancestry. And the question is, to what extent is that important if I'm interpreting your question right? We've looked at that um, we don't have a group. Unfortunately, we can't say what the impact is of whether or not they would grow up in a home with parents that shared their ethnicity, because we have no such group. But we have looked at whether or not the experience of discrimination has impacted the adopted individuals, or at least is associated with their uh, their 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 outcomes. That does not appear to be the case in the cognitive and um, social outcomes like educational attainment, but it does appear to be the case in terms of certain psychological or mental health problems. So for the transracial adoption group, they do experience somewhat elevated rates of uh, depression. We do diagnose depression and that is related to uh, their experience of, uh, of of being discriminated against. Whether or not they would have been discriminated against less had they not been transracially adopted, of course, I can't I can't say. I hope I'm answering your question. It's a it's a good and important question. Okay. So that I got I think I did the chat box. <laughs> so if there are there other questions? This is Deborah. Have- Can you jump in? Oh, Teresa, do you want to go ahead? No, go ahead, Deborah. I was trying to figure out how to raise my hand. So I'll raise my hand after I'll do your. You do, okay. You. Uh, so, Matt, this seems really important. And I from I come from a policy school, and I was wondering if you could suggest any poly, policy implications of the point where you are now in terms of the importance of actually somebody actually completing a college education in order to get all these other benefits. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not from a policy school. That's a cop out, I know. But I I think um, what are the policy implications? I can just give you my opinion, but it's no better than that. And maybe that's what you're asking for, anyway. That would be great. The I I was actually surprised with the finding, Um, not that there wouldn't be benefits, but that the benefits, at least as we measured them, were equal no matter what level of general cognitive ability you had. I I mean, it would be hard to argue that that isn't an argument in favor of what Obama talked about. That is that we should encourage people, I, I know there's debate about this, but that we should encourage people to pursue a college edu- education because it, it seems at least that uh, the success that accrues to that uh, as a consequence of that ed- education may not be a, a function of their underlying at least cognitive ability. So I don't know if that, that answers your question very well because again, I'm not a, a policy person, but I do think it, it, it certainly suggests, what, the one thing though, it, we, 
I, I should point out there, I mean, there are a lot of limitations and maybe I should have talked more about the limitations. Um, is that maybe we're not measuring the benefits of college well, or maybe we're too early in these people's lives. We're looking at them at age 29. Maybe things will look a lot different when they're 45. I, I mean, and maybe I'm not gonna be around when they're 40. Well, maybe I'll be around, but I'm not gonna be assessing them, right? But you know, it could be different then. But I, I do think actually, to me, it was kind of encouraging results. I don't, I, I don't know if I, that answers your your questions, but I, I in fact, the paper I, 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 I we're writing is it, 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 I'm hope, hoping that for more psychometrically oriented people, um, that that it that it would be a little bit of a challenge to the way they think about uh, the the world. But okay, we'll see. Can I? Should I? Oh, but Teresa, you had your hand up. So and then I'll go to the chat box. But I I can see a few people on their picture. It's a warning. So Teresa, did you want to ask a question? Sure. Um, thank you so much, Matt, for your talk today. I'm a social epidemiologist and uh, study education in some of the education literature and epidemiology on how it affects health. And uh, I think that the interdisciplinary perspective is really interesting and, and relevant for understanding the entire breadth of what predicts education and how education affects other outcomes. And I think that we get something different from psychology than from epidemiology than from ec economics. And for me, some of the questions in the causal frame uh, among epidemiologists or economists are very narrow. And they and in order to get that, you know, exchangeability or that you know causal contrast, but some of the predictors of education in the larger causal frame that may be more difficult are very important. Like what are parents, it, it, parents um, are endogenous to the system in a lot of ways, right? Like, and that's what the twin studies are trying to contribute. Um, um, and this, did you, anyways, what comes to mind is the different study designs give us different pieces of evidence that as population researchers, we have to piece together depending mm -hmm. on what we're interested in. Anyway, that was one reaction. I just think that your work is really interesting and, and contributing and, and the I don't know, the causal piece uh, is different in different disciplines. One mm -hmm. thing that I wanted to ask was about early life. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues in education and epidemiology talks about the racehorse effect. We're often trying to measure who's gonna win, win the, the horse race but we start in the middle of the race and the horse that's winning in the middle might win in the end. So when even you're studying early in life and adolescence, uh, you know, looking at things like IQ and personality, but a lot of those things have developed since the kids were really young and the educational opportunities that they've had or the barriers that they've had or the context, all of these things. So how do you, how do you account for those early life factors or how does that play into some of the research that you've seen on education and um, outcomes in terms of the importance of early life factors? Um, sorry, <laughs> I'm getting a call from my daughter. <laughs> um, the, <Speaking> <laughs> um, but we started at 11 and 17 because we were studying substance abuse. That's why the 11 is prior to kids starting uh, to use substances. And 17 is just prior to when they actually, in a typical uh, life course, the peak age of use. So it, it's not optimal, I agree. It's not optimal in terms of early life. Um, so art studies can't, I mean, not that they're, I, I certainly think they're important, but I, I, I don't, I'm not really in a position to say what is important. Well, the one thing I worry about, or at least think about is there, there are studies that link early experience with outcomes, like social outcomes, like educational attainment and those types of things. Um, but those are correlations and they're not often there's not often a strong basis for drawing a causal conclusion. There might be a cause. And, and so I, I, I would welcome 
younger people who would who would maybe use genetic designs, not because they're interested in genetics, but maybe because they um, they, they provide a, a stronger basis to actually draw inferences about environmental influences. And then kind of a reaction to your first point about the breath. I didn't have enough time to get into it here, but two factors that we find in the adoptive homes, I mean, we have tried to assess things, two factors that are, that are important. The first one is not gonna be surprising to anybody if you're talking about college attainment. And that is higher income families, even in the adoptive families, are more likely to get their kids through college. So, so that's not surprising. The other thing that's kind of surprising is the parents, we ask them when the kids are uh, like 13 or 14 years old, how far they think they're gonna go in school. Do they think they're gonna get a college education? And we find that the parents are actually able to predict that net the underlying ability of the kids. We can take out the ability effect. So they're not just, react, or any, even their grades in school. And, and so parents, and so probably parents are making some sort of estimation or expectation about what their kids are gonna do. And then they must do things, right? They create opportunities for their kids in order to meet those expectations. Okay, in the chat box. Uh, from hey, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to cut in here. I think we are out of time. So I just wanted oh, we're to out of time. cut okay, in I apologize. Say for those, those of you who need to go, feel free to do so. We thank you so much for speaking today. Um, Matt, I don't know if you have time to linger at all and answer a few more questions. If you well, do. I'll answer the, yeah, I'll, I can okay. linger. All right, so, so those who wanna linger, we'll, we'll stand for just a little longer here then. Okay. So I, I apologize to go over. So, but, so I hope I pronounce it right, Yuka. Um, if you're still around, Yuka, is it possible low IQ uh, college graduates tend to get more practical degrees? A critical mass of high IQ graduates get less practical degrees. It's <laughs> art, hist art history and philosophy. I think philosophy is actually very practical, but okay, I get your point. Um, I don't know. I actually, it's a it's a good question. One of the things that Aldo Rossessini from economics is is working on is we, we do know their their college majors, and we do know the schools they they've gone to, and so one of the things we're trying to do, although it's a massive amount of data to go through, is code. It, it's amazing how many different majors, college majors, there are. You, you would think, oh, there's maybe twenty five or fifty, right? No, there. are hundreds, if not thousands of different majors. So we're, we're actually involved in a, in a project to, to actually look at that. Um, I, I would, maybe it is the case that, um, that I, I'm sure there are differential motivations to, to, to go to college and, and, and maybe some people who are especially economically uh, privileged maybe the stakes aren't as high economically for them. And so they, they, maybe they, they, they take bigger gambles as to what they're doing. Whereas if, if the, if the stakes are high, then, then maybe you, you look for a more practical degree. I, I'm not sure, but hopefully Aldo will have that data for us in, in a year or so. But you mentioned before that they tended to be primarily women. Primarily women. Yeah, so the, the low the, IQ, high, I'm sorry, low uh, GCA uh, yeah. college graduates. I, I thought I heard you say that kind no, of. No, the, the group that, there's an interesting, I, I didn't do really much with it, Jerry. In the, there, there's, as I'm sure people appreciate, there, there are interesting phenomena going on with gender in that um, uh, the majority of, of college graduate now are in the US and in Europe and probably other, I think also even maybe in Asia, um, other parts of the world, uh, majority are women. And the, there are, if, if you look at the behavioral genetic literature, and this was actually in that twin study that we, we showed as well, um, Historically, the importance, the, the predictability from genetics to educational attainment was weaker in women than men. And the explanation for that was that there were barriers placed 
in, in the path, in the educational pathway of women that didn't allow them in a sense to, to uh, take advantage of whatever genetic talents they had. So, so genetics was less important for women because what was important were circumstances and, and not their underlying ability. Over time, and this has been shown actually in, a, in several studies now, over time, there has been a convergence of, um, of the importance of genetics for men and women. Nonetheless, definitely for sure, women do better educationally than men. Exactly why, it's, in, in part it's because of, I, I think in part because of the non-ability personality factors. We know on average women are more conscientious, on average, more conscientious than men. Um, on average, they're less, they're more future oriented, they're less impulsive. Again, there's a lot of overlap, but so those are just averages. I, I don't know that that fully accounts for the, uh, the, the gender differences in, in college attainment, but I'm sure, I, I would think it contributes to it. The, the other interesting thing, it, I'm not a gender expert, but the other is that we, we don't get a lot of gender interactions in our, our, our study. Maybe our sample's not large enough. We, we get the main effects, but not necessarily the interactions. Um, but college is less predictive in our sample of both occupational attainment and income in women than men. So, so women are more likely to get a college degree, but quote unquote, the benefits associated with that degree are less pronounced. They're in the same direction, but they're less pronounced in women than men. So there's a, a, there's a lot of interesting things with gender that are going on. Okay, it looks like we have a question from Christopher and from Claire, if you have time. Yeah, th thank you, Matt. This is terrific and I learned a ton. I'm thinking as a, I was really intrigued with the, the contribution of the control aspect of personality to some of these differences and and one, as a criminologist, I was, I was curious about to what degree that's tapping things like impulsivity or, or even like behavioral delinquency in any way. I'm sorry, Chris, my hearing is not the best. Could you? Oh, oh sure. <laughs> I, I heard most of it, but not all of it. I yeah, apologize. I'm, I'm intrigued with the control aspect of uh, the personality scale. Yeah. And, and, and to what extent, um, what's in that measure? And, and does that include um, the things that criminologists would think of as impulsivity or low self-control, uh, et cetera? Yes. Yeah, that, so that is, um, yeah, it's, a, it's an 18 item personality scale. I, I can't re recall any specific items off the top of my head, but it would be things like, uh, I act without thinking. It might be a, a type of item. Um, I, I like to, to do things on the spur of the moment. Um, so they're, they're all items like that. Um, and actually it, it, there's, we're working with a soci, I think he's a sociologist now because we, it's an interesting construct. I don't know that your area, I don't know that all the research in, in, in the area. I, I know the, the old work by Hershey and, Right. The, the self-control theory of crime. So that I'm familiar with. I, I don't know if it's considered credible anymore. But anyway, mm -hmm. we actually measure that trait of oh. self-control, which is considered very uh, uh, important, I know, in, in various areas. We've measured it probably five or six times in the lifetime mm. of these individuals, both in adopted and non-adopted. So if somebody's interested in the in the data or something, yeah. yeah. Uh, and we get it in the parents as, as well as the kids. And we know something about the family. So we actually have, and the, to me, one of the things I, I, I find fascinating, I actually just a personal note, I apologize, it's a personal note. I have two daughters. My daughters are adopted. Mm. So, um, and what's interesting to me in our sample um, and maybe I, I, I shouldn't apply it to my, <laughs> my personal situation, is that the personalities, the personalities of adopted siblings are almost perfectly uncorrelated. There are exceptions. Their IQs are correlated significantly. 
Their educational levels are correlated, as you would expect. There, we have a paper that's under review now that shows that whether or not they're authoritarian is correlated. So their political attitudes are correlated, but not whether or not they're extroverted or introverted or anxious. That seems to be something that families, what, for however families work, it doesn't seem to mold the children to have similar personalities. So it, it, they have effects in other ways, but maybe not in personality. So Claire, you had a question then? Yes. Um, hi. My question was, um, sorry, my question just went away. Okay. So first of all, I was wondering, I'm assuming you don't have any measure of temperament because it'd be nice if we had a personality measure that was less influenced by, though, you know, your, your argument for not being influenced by socialization, I thought was powerful. Um, one thing I was wondering about is how many of the siblings actually have different education levels? How much variation is there where you can actually, because when I think about these kinds of designs, I think about, you know, exploiting the fact that we have shared environments and non-shared environments. And I guess maybe I kind of missed that, but how many, it just seems like it's so strongly correlated. I was wondering how much power we had to really even figure out how much it matters environment versus yes. a genetic personality. Okay. So um, I, I won't try to dig it up, but, but uh, I should have come from better prepared, Clara. It's a good question. But if, if I look at, I mean, there are various ways of measuring, obviously, educational attainment. I could do it based on the, the, the degree a person achieves or the number of years of education they've completed. Um, let's take the latter, um, the number of years of education. In our studies, monozygotic twins are correlated really very high. And Jerry's found this as well, I think, in his Danish work. I think on the order of about 0.7 for years of education, it's very high. There are monozygotic twins who have different levels of education, right? I had almost a hundred pair where one had a college degree and one did not. So that happens. If I look at dizygotic twins, the correlation drops to about Oh, about 0.5 to 0.55. So it's not as high as the MZ, but it's still pretty high. If I look at adopted siblings, and this correlation I actually do know off the top of my head, the correlation is even lower than the dizygotic twins. It's about 0.4. So there's actually quite a lot of education within family educational variability in the adopted families. Um, I've always kind of wondered how that works. The adoptive families tend to be kind of skewed. The parents tend to have higher educations. Those are the parents who tend to be adopt. And, and I, I, I've wondered from time to time about the, the dynamic of the family when you have highly educated parents, but kids that are discordant in, in, in uh, the pursuit of, of, of getting a college education. But there's actually quite a lot of variability, especially in the adopted siblings and how far they go in school. Quite a few do not, are discordant. Um, and even in the MZs where there's a high correlation, we still got 99 pairs where one completed college and one did not. All right, and with that, it is almost 1.30 here. So I suppose we better okay. wrap it up. But thank I appreciate you. The, the kind questions and the kind opportunity to talk with you. So thank you very much if you, if you have any other questions or if you're interested in data. We like to share our data if we, if we can. We've collected a lot of data. <laughs> so, and now we're actually collecting health data. So, uh, so if anybody's interested, just email me. Thank you very much, Stacy. All right, thank you everyone. Thanks, Greg.